Welcome to Faster Scotland, our brand new YouTube channel. I'm Duncan Vincent, one of the presenters, and I'm going to be bringing you all the action which I feel fit from two wheels. This is Hannah, and she's going to be giving you action from four wheels on the race circuit. And across here, we've got Joey, and he is your rally man. So today I'm going to be doing a feature on a Ford Focus. It's really exciting, I can't believe they're letting me loosen it, um, but we'll see how it goes. And as Duncan mentioned earlier, I'll be covering all aspects of rallying. And speaking of proper motorsport, I caught up with Jimmy McRae this morning. Colin McRae, a name known to millions of rally fans across the world. But did you know there used to be a rally called Colin McRae Stages? So how is it possible for a rally with such an iconic name to be cancelled? Well, I've invited Jimmy McRae and John Fife, who is a press officer for Colton's Car Club, to discuss the issue. So guys, how is it possible for a rally with such an iconic name to be cancelled? I think it's just a sign of the times, lack of money. The, the, the Colin McRae rally is the last rally of the season. People run out of money and uh, there's more and more uh, cost to run the rally nowadays. So if the club can't get the entries, then you know they just can't afford to run the rally on. Okay. John? Well, there is that break-even point to consider because before we can even get into the forest, you've got to pay £688 for every mile of forest used. So add that up, I'm not going to try it, but 45 miles at £688, that's what an amateur club is looking at before a car has turned a wheel in anger. Mm -hmm. So you really need to get a minimum number of entries, which is around 85, to make a one-day event viable in this country. And if you don't get 85 entries, the club stands to make a big loss. Therefore, it has to make that decision. Do we run or don't we? But so what do you think, what, what shall be done in order to bring this iconic rally back? Get close public roads. Okay. That's the only option available to us because we're getting priced out of the forest. And it's not just a question of price in the forest, it's manpower needed now to run a forest rally. Because there are new safety rules, new restrictions, new regulations in force. And for an amateur club to take on this task, it, it's a mammoth, Herculean effort that's required to put on a one-day rally. And a lot of clubs are just saying, is it worth it? Because these guys are doing it at nights and at weekends, they're having to do route wreckies, they're having to contact local landowners, they're having to deal with local businesses, local councils. There's a pile of paperwork to get through. The safety plan for the Colin McRae rally latterly was 28 pages. Now with the new regulations coming in, it's 40, 50 pages long because we have to have everything sorted out to the satisfaction of this new um, beast that we have in the forest, the safety delegate. This is the MSA appointee who determines whether the rally is safe to run or not. Uh, yeah, it would be a shame if we lost the forest because it's, it, it is something you know that any rally driver enjoys is driving through the forest flat out. Uh, but if it's going to price itself out of the market, then what do you do? Well, on a positive note, Chris Mick has won the Rally of Portugal yesterday. Fabulous. Oh, great. Well, I was the first, I was the first McCree to sit beside Chris Meek. It was a test we did down in the, down in the borders, down in, in uh, Dumfrieshire. And I invited, uh, Colin was doing something with another young guy. I said, I think we should get Chris Meek over. And I sat beside Chris Meek then, and I thought, well, it's something else. And actually, at the end of the day, I said to Colin, I said, go and sit beside that young guy and see what you think. And obviously Colin thought a lot of them because uh, Colin took him under his wing and it's great to see it, you know, it's unfortunate that he didn't get the stepping stone after he won the European Champion to get straight into the World Championship but he's, he's still got time in his hands. Yeah, many people thought it's the end of the era ultimately, mm -hmm. but obviously he proved them all wrong. Um, and with the new WRC coming in 2017, obviously he's got all the car than anyone else in the field, yet he still won the rally. Well, he's a bit younger than me and I reckon I've still got it. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've still got it too, <laughs> So, with the new regulations coming in 2017, with new body care and uh, new cars completely, what do you think? I, per I personally think that's wrong. I think uh, it's going back to the Group B cars, you know, and these, these cars... Is that all the spectators want, though? 
it's for spectators. I don't know. I don't really know that. that you know, there'll be much difference. And if there is an accident, it's going to be a bigger accident. You know, right. I think you know. The, if you go back to the Group B cars, it, it, it climbed up, climbed up the Group B cars, and there were a couple of really bad accidents. Then they come back down again, and they're just going back up. Personally, I think they should have stuck with the R5 technology. Okay, so so you reckon they should run R5 in WRC Championship as a well, on top level? Well, the WRC as it was, I think the cars were quick enough as, as they were without, you know. Uh, one of, one, of the, one of the things, okay, aerodynamics and things like that, but, you know, to increase the size of the restrictor, you know, to give it suddenly another 40 brake horsepower, mm, I don't know whether it's right or not. What we need is stability in the World Championship. This business has changed the cars season after season, year after mm -hmm. year. It just adds to the cost. Mm -hmm. I mean, what price is a World Rally car these days? Mm -hmm. If you could yeah, buy one, one brand new, straight at the workshop, mm -hmm. half a million? Mm -hmm. No. no? More than that. Half a million? Yeah. Will be. It will you be. can buy an R5 car for what, just under 200,000? R5, well, if you want the proper R5 with all the, the proper bits in it, it's over 200,000. Yeah. Wow. So a World Rally car is almost double the price. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't think that's the way forward? I bet, me personally, I don't think it is. It's all very well having 10 or a dozen works cars at the head of the field, but no rally can run on just 10 or 12 entries. We need the clubbing behind them, we need the national runners, we need European championship runners behind them. And if we price them out of the sport, where are the future rally stars going to come? We've got to encourage people in. And the way to do that is to try and keep the technology level lower and the prices lower. It all means that the world rally cars do their own thing because these guys are just throw money at any problem. But if we could cap that and if we can make the lower ranks more affordable, then rallying in the forests on gravel roads as a future. At the moment, the future's looking distinctly foggy. Okay. Right, come on Joe, what's your first memory of Colin McRae? Well, it was back in 2006 when I first met Colin. Um, it was right here at the stages, um, and he was coming down the hill in, the, in his Mark One Escort. It was kind of brownie colour, um, with his super flamboyant style. I was standing right there in that spot there, and he was almost, almost touching my feet. That's you were I, over here on the banking? Right here. And where was his back wheel? <laughs> it was literally <laughs> a, a centimetre away from our feet. I've, I've still got a picture of that. And that was the first time I met Colin. It was like, best day ever. So Jimmy has invited me for a last ride in Colin's escort. And I'm not going to say no to that. So what do you guys think? Well, interesting. Jimmy McRae, absolute rallying legend, and the McRae rally name is huge. However, if running about a muddy forest in an escort is your thing, Joey, that's fine. My thing, however, is more circuit driving, and Joey happened to let me loose in a Ford Focus earlier on. I managed to scare the cameraman just a little bit. Um, I think he let out a couple of girly screams, so we'll have a look at that right now. <laughs> This is one of the quickest Ford Focuses in the country. With almost a thousand brake horsepower, nitrous, and a massive turbo, this car has quite a cult following on the internet. And here's why. Whoa. That spectacular blow up has been viewed over a million times on Facebook. I'm happy to report that the car is now back and we brought it up to Knock Hill Racing Circuit to give it a proper blast around the track and I can't wait to get behind the wheel. So here we are in the car, fully rebuilt, ready to go, no expense spared, let's see how it drives. The 
first thing you notice when you start the car is the noise. It's deafening. You can hardly hear yourself think, making things very difficult to record in car. The next thing you notice is brutal acceleration. After a steady lap to warm up the tyres, I opened it up. driving this around the track for a good number of laps. It took a few laps to get into it because the car is just an absolute monster. It just wants to fight you, but it's just, it handles so well. It turns into the corners brilliantly. It just, it's glued to the road. The amount of power under this bonnet and the way the brakes slow the car down is just brilliant. I feel really privileged to have had a shot of this car. It just, I'm kind of speechless. It's just so fast. I've never really driven anything like it. So I'm happy. Hopefully you're all happy too. <laughs> so, just back in off track from driving the Ford Focus. Very impressive car, fastest thing I've ever driven. Very bright as well, you can see a mile away. Based on the legend himself, Valentino Rossi. Do you know who that is, Joey? Yes, I do, but I wouldn't necessarily call him a legend. You wouldn't? Really? I would call him God. He is the two-wheel phenomenon. Are you, are you a phobia? Do you have a phobia for two wheels, Joey? No, I don't. I just think they're silly. I think he's a bit scared. I think he's scared. Would you yeah. take a challenge, Joey? Do you fancy a bit of a race? I'll race you on anything and I'm still going to win. Okay. Me on four wheels? You on two wheels? This I would like to see. Let's go and get some leathers on. <laughs> so as we watch Joseph getting into a real pair of leathers there, I always need a hand and we've got helpful strutters on hand to slip them in there. Joseph does look a little bit pasty white and slightly nervous. The Knock Hill Kart track itself, well, it's very tight, it's very twisty, it's ideal for mini motor racing. And believe it or not, this is where a lot of the kids come and actually hone their skills on mini motors in Scotland. The carts, well, they're powered by gas, they're very fast, very reliable, and this should be a cracking race. Right, Joey, happy? Yep. Yeah, you're looking, you're looking quite... Look, look like a condom, but then you're, you're looking like factory, as we would say in the biggest in terms. Now behave, okay? This is a race, I'm going to smoke you. There's going to be one <laughs> winner, and one winner only. And that will be me. Mm, that makes sense. Please don't hurt yourself, because we need you for the rest of the show. So after that safety briefing, there's nothing less than hit the track. That's what we're wanting to do. Joseph gets a proper safety briefing from Sandy. Sandy McIntosh. Him and his son Alan run these Pellini Mini Motor bikes and this is one of the higher bikes which Joseph's been given a shot of. Getting told exactly how it works and what he should be doing. And if that's not a man looking nervous in leathers, I really don't know what is. So after a few practice laps, after Joseph was happy on the track, 
We decided there's only really one thing to do. Let's get this race happening. That wobbly start wasn't anything to go by. We knew what was just ahead of us and in the pipeline. Joseph on the left, myself on the right, Hannah in the middle, and she starts the race, and away we go. For the first couple of hundred yards, it looked like Joseph knew exactly what he was doing, but then he had to try and get around the corner. End of lap one. Small lead for the car. Joseph, doing well, a little wobbling towards the corner, seemed to upset him just that little bit, then he was away, head back down, even in a little cool wobble, like he knew what he was doing. End of the lap, yes, the Blonker in the car managed to have a spin, so Joseph comes back round ahead. I wasn't going to have that though, I tried to sneak past next to the corner and he cuts me off. However, I think we lost Joseph on this lap, managed to come round with a massive, massive lead, and where was Joey? After having one wobble, we then caught this on camera. Taxi for Joey. I don't know if that was an embarrassing wave to the camera or don't worry, I'm okay. Either way, we don't really care, but he got back on his bike, straight back up to race pace, with a few more wobbles. And just watch this one. This is a belter. Thankfully Joey once again, a -OK, gets up, past the camera, and wobbles away, nursing his pride. So at the end of it, Hannah gave his checkered flag, I managed to squeeze the victory by four laps. Joseph sitting with his head, head down a little bit as the cart comes up, and look at that for a bit of parking, absolutely perfect. Cart versus bike, well, the cart won this time. What a race that was, it was very interesting. I um, kind of expected a bit more from you, Joey. I think maybe even I could beat you in a bike, but um, what do you guys think about that? Personally, myself, it was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> well, I must admit, anyone that races motorbikes is brave and skilled, just like you, Duncan. Oh, thank you very much, Joey. That's, uh, it's not gonna get you anywhere, though. <laughs> Hannah, we're the brave, skilled ones here, but what we're gonna do now is we're gonna pop along to see a very good friend of mine, a man who races motorbikes for a living, a professional road racer, and a guy that races in Isle of Man TT. Let's go and catch up with Keith Amor. So today we're in Stirlingshire, and we're going to meet Keith Amor. He's gonna take us on a little tour of his garage, and the five times Isle of Man podium winner is gonna tell us how he got involved in bike racing. And as usual, Keith's late. Very late. All right, young man. Good to see you, buddy. Sorry, boy. That's okay, better late than never. Keith, can you tell us how you managed to get into bike racing in the first place? The honest answer? Um, I actually, Passed my test in 2000 and I managed to get a Yamaha R1, the new 2000, I think it was 2001, um, and I pretty much nearly killed myself about 18 times on the road, but I bought the bike on higher purchase so I couldn't sell it and a friend of mine uh, asked me if I would go racing and I didn't really want to go racing and he nagged me, nagged me, nagged me, nagged me, so one day a friend of mine uh, Marcus and myself went up to not kill in a P100 pickup. Uh, we put a set of bodywork on the bike and went out and practiced. And I came back in and I said, how am I doing? He said, well, you're pretty much going nearly as fast as most of these guys. So I said, right, we'll go and race. So I raced 2001. Um, I think I finished eighth my first race for the back of the grid and then seventh. And in the second meeting, I got two thirds and then I went to East Fortune and won. I thought, well, this is the path to go. Um, but unfortunately, I tried to do the British Championship and just didn't have the funding. And we went to watch the, it's actually 2004, we went to watch the North West 200. And a friend of mine, uh, Derek McConaughey, said to me, you'd be good at this. I said, why? He said, because you're an idiot. Because he'd been riding with me on the road. I said, well, that's why I don't ride on the road anymore. He said, yeah, but there's no buses and trucks coming the other way here, is there? I said, well, I can't afford it. He said, well, if I can get you some sponsorship, would you do it? So I said, yeah. So I ended up uh, starting racing proper in 2005 up at Notkill, 
I won the Scottish Championship, um, and I went and done the Northwest 200 for the first time. And then in 2007, I ended up with um, Yule Duncan racing, and then that team split. And then in 2007, and one of the main sponsors, Wilson Craig, said, "Well, why don't we start a a team?" So I ended up racing for Wilson 2008 and nine, and that's when I started doing the proper road racing, as they call it, between the hedges. That took you over to the MRTT TT and your great success at Isle Man TT. What, what would you say your biggest success on the island was? Um, I don't know, I, I, I'm not sure exactly how many, I've had five podiums or something. Um, I, I don't know what they were, two seconds and three thirds or whatever. Um, I finished six seconds behind Bruce Anstey, one of the races, which was a uh, rerun. Um, and I would have won it the first time round because Bruce hadn't woken up. But when they rerun the race, Bruce woke up again. So I finished second time there. But it was a really, really, really good race. Um, I think him, myself, and somebody else were stuck together for quite a lot of the race. And halfway around the last lap, I um, got the hammer down and passed them all and pulled away from them and got to the finish line first. And I thought if I'd actually ridden like that from the beginning, I would have won the race. That was probably my, my most enjoyable one. Uh, most frustrating one was 2010 when I was lying, I don't know, 10 seconds behind Hutchie and the senior on the HM plant Honda bike. And uh, unfortunately, it stopped halfway around the last lap. But I mean, that's TT, it's a machine. From what I remember, it stopped beside your teammate as well, and that, that's a good thing to bring up. Who is, uh, <clears throat> who's your best teammate been? You've had a good few of them. Who, oh, who's your favourite and best? Oh, John, I mean, John and I. We have quite a similar um, sense of humour. John McGuinness? Yeah. Uh, I think sometimes um, Neil Tuxworth didn't quite enjoy our sense of humour sometimes and we got in a, a little bit of trouble now and again. I don't think we actually officially got boardroomed, but we were close quite a few times. No, John and I got on really, really well. Um, he's a bit like me. I mean, he really, really enjoys the enduro motocross, doing the whole, everything, the bikes. And he's the only person that's, he's, he let me follow him around the TT, mm -hmm. and he's never, ever, ever let anybody follow him around the TT course before in practice. What does Keith Amor do to chill and relax? You're, you're a family man, your wife, two kids, lovely house, you know, what do you do to chill? Um, as little as possible. Uh, now the summer's here again, uh, I'll probably go out riding a lot more. I mean, I've got a brand new motocross bike that I haven't actually even ridden yet because I don't want to get dirty. But now that the sun's out again, I'm going to go and play on that. It's my passion. You know, as much as I like riding the race bikes and what and what and what, I've grew up with motocross bikes. Well, let's go for a wee tour of the garage. I think it's about time. Sure? Yeah. It's dirty. Keith, we're standing in this beautiful garage. We've got a, a lovely assortment of bikes. Can you can you talk us through what we have sitting here? Looks like we've got a, a possible road bike and the race version. Yeah, basically start off absolutely identical. The only thing we've changed on this is obviously the, the paintwork. Um, we've changed the exhaust on it. Um, other than that, start my bike. Anyway, this is the race version. Now, as you can see, different uh, chain, different bits chain, different bits sprockets, full titanium bolts, lightweight discs, Factory hydrophobic system. Right, so this is your race. Lap times come up. TC trim, traction control, plus up and down, obviously. And then obviously the opposite way. Mm -hmm. Then we have got, uh, we may think, you'll, you'll like this one. Pit lane speed limiter. Oh, yeah, I like the disco lights. So when we're coming in at the TT, we come in, bang it on. As soon as you come to the far end, bang, you go again. Okay. Um, Put a price on the fully fitted race bike. The parts, to me, with everything, with everything that's been done to the cylinder head, and it'll be the best part of the with labour, about forty thousand pounds. We can just come across here now, because this is work, as you say. This yeah. is work. This is your baby, 
And, uh, and this is, wait, this is fun time, isn't it? This is where it all started for Keith Amor. This is, yeah, I mean, this is my, yeah, passion. I mean, I absolutely love riding a motor. It's funny, like, Jonathan Ray and I are both the same. This is, no, that is a job. That's what we do for fun. The bike, the, the rig deluge, super bike. I like, I like to call it the big dog. The big dog, as well, it's, uh, I mean, horsepower wise, can you tell us? Well in excess of 200 and something, something. And a price tag? Probably cost me somewhere in the region of 60,000 to build it. Top speed? Uh, tailwind of the North West is probably good for 25, 26, 208 mile an hour, somewhere there. And how easy is it to ride compared to the super stock bike, which is essentially the sister bike, which is parked just next to it? Is it easier or is it harder to ride? The biggest issue with the, as you can see, I mean, it's got completely different triple clamps on it, and obviously this is all carbon, we're not allowed that. It's lighter, it's got, well, 10,000 pound forks on it, it's got the Brembo, it's got everything. But the trouble with having everything and having it so multi adjustable, I found that we got lost last year. Right, okay. And we did get lost. Okay, your, your favourite teammate, best teammate, John McGuinness. Yep. The fastest man in the Isle of Man TT. Has John peaked at the Isle of Man TT? Do you think he'll go any quicker at the Isle of Man TT? Um, well, yeah, I haven't spoke to him yesterday. He is, sounds very confident. He was, he's in a happy place. And generally when John's in a happy place means he's, he's going to be, anything can happen at the TT. What a great, honest interview with Keith Amor there. As ever, the guy is a legend, Joey, when it comes to bike racing. Well, I must agree. It's a massive commitment from those guys on the public roads. I definitely agree. I think I've got the bug for two wheels now. I'd love to give it a go. Not that I'd ever be anywhere near on the level that this guy is. What a legend. I am really impressed. Honestly, you're just into leathers, aren't you? Well, that bit as well. <laughs> yeah. We hope you've enjoyed Faster Scotland. This is our first show, episode number one. Keep your eye on our YouTube channel for further updates and like and subscribe. Until then, cheers, guys. See ya. See ya. Bye.